All right, uh, let's get rolling. We have uh, quite a bit to get through. So, uh, hey, uh, my name's uh, Richard Waring. I'm a production engineer at Facebook. I'm on the Warehouse Foundation team. Um, and I work uh, on storage-related problems uh, in the data warehouse, uh, specifically on a, on a storage system we use uh, called Warm Storage. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about uh, uh, an idea uh, we came up with um, called Hybrid XFS and kind of the, the story and background on how we came from, the, from an idea all the way to kind of rolling this out uh, to an exabyte storage system, uh, really multi-exabyte storage system in, in about 12 months. So first, uh, I think before you even get into the problem, I think it's important to kind of understand like uh, you know, as a store engineer, engineer uh, uh, like you know, at, at Facebook at least, like what is our job? What is our what is our goal? Um, and it's really to keep our systems storage bound uh, as long as possible. I always tell new engineers that come onto our teams, I was like, your job is to take that dotted line and keep kicking it as far to the right as you possibly can. Uh, we're storage engineers, not I/O engineers. Uh, we want to keep these systems uh, being used for storage. Um, So what kind of, uh, what are some of the factors that kind of uh, make this job pretty tough? So the first one is if we look at the vendor uh, roadmaps, uh, you'll kind of see something like this. Um, we have kind of, uh, kind of traditional uh, hard drive technology, also called PMR, PMR Plus, um, that we use today. And these uh, work all the way up into around 14 TB, even maybe 16 TB. And, uh, but coming online in like 2020, 2022 and onward is gonna be the hammer and mammer drives. And the densities as you can see are gonna be getting pretty insane. Um, like there's talk of things like 40 terabyte, terabyte drives um, out to say the mid, uh, midpoint of the next decade. Um, so these are, these are pretty kind of daunting sizes of drives. Um, and that's gonna, and, and the other complicating factor here is if we look at the amount of IO that these drives are giving us, um, it has not kept up. I think this is kind of a fact everyone kind of knows about. Uh, if you look at it uh, through the lens of uh, IOPS per terabyte, uh, you end up with kind of a chart something like this. So you can kind of see it's a pretty uh, precipitous decline. So, so some of that is just kind of a strategic concern. Uh, kind of the landscape is changing very quickly and we need uh, to kind of react to this. The second thing is uh, POSIX file system behavior. Um, we've built a lot of our store systems on uh, basically XFS, and uh, XFS is a great general purpose file system, um, but it was not designed with kind of distributed storage in mind. Uh, and in doing so, it has certain kind of uh, behaviors which make total sense uh, from the point of having a file system that runs on uh, a Unix machine or a Linux machine. Uh, and you know, if you look at XFS, uh, when you do a write, uh, it's going to journal the metadata, it's gonna write the data block, and then eventually it's gonna flush that, uh, flush their journal. And uh, on the read side, uh, potentially you'll have uh, a hit on the drive for uh, reading the metadata, uh, if it's not in page cache, and uh, finally you'll read the data. So you can kind of see like for small IOs, uh, instead of doing one, you're potentially doing three or you're potentially doing two. Um, we actually kind of, uh, when we started kind of digging into this a little bit more, we, we used a tool called uh, Block Trace, um, and you can kind of see uh, when we did it on our systems, you kind of see things like this. 24% um, of all the IOs going into the uh, file system are actually metadata writes. You start adding up this, uh, this amount of uh, IO, it's actually like non-trivial. You start adding it up on an exabyte storage system, it's a lot of money. So traditionally, how do people deal with this? Um, kind of the standard Linux answer is like, hey, page cache, that's what it's for. Um, you just like put a bunch of DRAM in your machines, it just works. Uh, and indeed, it's super simple, uh, works for almost any storage system. Uh, the cons are it's, uh, DRAM's not free. Uh, at, at scale, uh, it becomes really expensive. Uh, there's also little control. Our software engineers kind of want pretty nuanced control of like what is gonna be cached and what's not. Uh, we tend to have more information about the data than the operating system, so we can kind of make those decisions a little bit better. Uh, so as soon as we go into that area, uh, page cache becomes uh, less useful. Uh, the other thing we actually found, just maybe not ob non-obvious, uh, our systems are pretty lean. When we're making these systems, uh, uh, we, on, on the storage side, we don't put piles of memory and CPU into them. Uh, we try and keep them as lean as possible. Uh, so things like memory bandwidth actually becomes a concern. So the less kind of uh, I.O. we can do on the, on the uh, memory bus, the better. 
the other uh, classic uh, solution to this would be like a dedicated meta store. Uh, on a lot of big systems, uh, you'll see at companies like Facebook, uh, this could be uh, a dedicated meta store. Um, and these are uh, pretty good, and indeed our, uh, our store system actually does have a, a dedicated metadata store uh, for uh, our level of objects that we store. Um, but this does not uh, go down to like the XFS file system level. Um, and these work pretty well, uh, they handle write heavy workloads pretty well. Um, the cons are they're, they're complex, um, they're actually hard to get right. Um, there's a lot of kind of landmines when you're designing these things to make sure that they scale correctly. We've gone through probably a, a couple generations of our metadata layer to try and get it right. And of course, they're proprietary. Um, so you kind of don't benefit from the open source community's kind of uh, collective wisdom and knowledge and all that kind of decades of storage engineering knowledge can be, can be lost. So with hybrid XFS, um, it's really XFS with real-time subvolumes. This is actually kind of a feature um, that I don't think is either well understood or even most people even uh, know it exists. Um, and it's basically taking uh, XFS and uh, adding in a second block device. So the standard block device everyone kind of knows and loves, you've got a metadata uh, portion of the file system, you've got your journal, and then you've got your data. Um, what real-time mode does is it actually adds in this kind of second block device called the real-time block device um, where you can also store data. And uh, how you can, if you store data there is controlled by a real-time flag that you can either place on the file system, the directory, um, or an individual file. The other thing uh, to understand about uh, kind of the real-time mode is um, it's actually got a separate allocator for that real-time device, and I'll get into that in a second. So how do we apply this? Um, we basically swap it out the uh, standard block device, we put an SSD there, um, and uh, for the real-time device, we use a hard disk. Uh, it's really that simple. Um, and then we layer on a few other things that we'll get into in a second that kind of creates the whole hybrid XFS uh, system. So the real-time allocator, um, I think it's worth uh, kind of pausing for a moment and kind of, kind of diving into how this allocator works. Um, a lot of systems uh, tend to solve this problem using uh, raw disk, like just writing to the raw disk and then managing that data themselves. Um, and frankly, I think a lot of them end up with something that actually looks quite a bit like this. They take a drive, they chop it up into a bunch of pieces, um, which kind of look like extents from an XFS standpoint. Um, and they're of a fixed size. Um, and indeed, that's really what the real-time uh, bitmap block allocator actually does. It takes the drive, you can pick whatever size you want to chop it up as, uh, that becomes your extents, and when you write data, um, it's basically going to slam that data into one or more of these extents. Um, and if you're, you're writing something over the extent size, it's going to try, just like a normal uh, block allocator would, uh, is find you a, a, a biggest piece it can uh, that's contiguous. So that kind of behavior is still there. Um, but in contrast to, say, the AG allocator on XFS, um, most of the AG allocator kind of brains that you might be used to or heuristics that AG allocator has uh, do not exist in this, uh, this allocator. So, for example, things like uh, AG, the AG allocator has a certain uh, ability to uh, hold open uh, a large extent of the file um, if you're streaming writes to it, and then it will kind of close it if it sees that uh, those writes uh, cease. And in doing so, it can create, like, kind of large... Uh, continuous uh, uh, files on the file system. Uh, another behavior this thing will not have, for example, that, X, that the AG allocator does is also this notion that it can, uh, the AG allocator can kind of dynamically allocate you extents based on how much space is on the, on the drive. Uh, the real-time allocator, you don't get any of that. So in order to make this kind of all work, um, the uh, kind of real-time uh, mode of XFS was uh, uh, not perfect. Um, Things that we wanted to change included kind of these three aspects. Um, we wanted to change how StatFS worked. Um, when we started using this, uh, it would actually return the amount of space on the SSD, not the hard disk, um, regardless of what flags you had on the file system. So if you were actually like defaulting the data to the hard disk, it would still show you uh, the StatFS information for the SSD. Kind of non-intuitive, we wanted to change that. Um, we also wanted to change that so like a lot of our tooling wouldn't break as well. And the other thing we want to change is actually, um, we kind of had our eye on small files from the beginning. Uh, we wanted to make sure that small files uh, could get routed to the SSD. In doing that, we kind of, uh, we created a couple patches to facilitate this, the RT Alex size and RT uh, fallback percentage uh, patch. Uh, 
And uh, the idea behind these is it would just kind of automatically route small files to the SSD and fall, and fall back to the hard disk um, if that failed. Now, in collaborating with uh, uh, Upstream and, and uh, the XFS maintainers, uh, you don't always get what you want. Indeed, that uh, was the case for us. Um, they kind of gave us, uh, we settled on a modified version of this patch, which basically, uh, based on the presence of uh, the RT inherit flag on the XFS file system, it would actually give us the behavior we wanted. Um, so no flag, it actually just kind of magically works uh, the way you would, you would expect it to. So how do we actually deploy this uh, at Facebook? Um, you'll actually see something like this. We take an SSD, we chop it up into however many pieces um, we need, one, for one piece or one partition for each drive we have on the system. Um, we then map those partitions over to our hard drives. Um, and on the SSD partitions, we have our metadata, um, our metadata and our intent log. And on our hard disks, we have our data blocks. Um, what you'll notice here is we don't actually put data in our kind of Gen 1 version of this on the SSD yet. Um, I'll get into that in a second. So how does this actually look like when you actually log into a system and, and view a hybrid XFS system? Um, when you look at the mount, you'll actually see it's mounting the SSD partition, and you'll only see the hard drive show up uh, in the mount parameters. You'll see this like RT dev thing. Uh, that's your hard disk. Um, and when you're actually on the file system, it actually looks and feels just like a normal XFS file system, except when you write data to it, it goes to the hard drive, not the SSD, and the metadata goes to the SSD. Um, and we can kind of, after we did this, we of course want to like go back to block trace, verify we kind of get the expected behavior we want. Um, and indeed we do, on the hard drive, uh, there's zero metadata operations, it's all just purely beautiful data writes going to that device. So uh, some of you might also uh, be kind of uh, thinking right now, like, hey, you have like all these drives hooked up to the SSD. This sounds like a horrible, terrible, scary idea. Uh, what happens if that, that SSD fails? Um, you lose all your drives, right? So we were thinking of this too. Um, and uh, we, uh, we wanted a contingency plan should this happen. Uh, for example, maybe we get a big batch of uh, SSDs from a vendor and they have a firmware bug and we start seeing these things drop like flies. We obviously don't want to lose all our data. So we thought of that and introduced a metadata rescue partition on all, every single one of our drives. So if you look at our uh, hard disks, we actually have this extra section um, which is size uh, proportionate to the SSD partition. Uh, in the event we see something like that or we just want to do maintenance, we can simply drain all the metadata over to the hard disk remount the file system, and we're back to kind of a hard drive only mode. Um, we've lost some of our I.O., but our data is safe, um, and we can then swap out the SSD, um, or just kind of operate in a degraded mode if necessary. All right, so that's basically uh, the nuts and bolts of HybridXFS. Um, so we didn't actually jump into the rollout uh, uh, all in. We wanted to actually do a proof of concept first, um, part of uh, doing engineering at Facebook is um, you basically have to convince your colleagues that, hey, this idea you want to do is actually a good idea. Uh, in order to do that, we did a proof of concept. So what metrics did we look at? Um, so again, top of mind was like, hey, we un understood the risk from the outset of this that uh, hooking up a bunch of drives into a single device uh, could be risky. Um, but we did the math and we figured that if the AFR stayed within the manufacturer specs, um, we should be all right. Um, this basically, the probability of an SSD failing along with all your hard drives failing, uh, you can basically model that as simply adding that probability onto all the failure rates of your hard drives. So if your hard drive has a, a failure rate of say 2%, your SSD has a failure rate of 0.4%, uh, your new failure rate is 2.4%. And you can kind of model that and figure out if you're gonna be okay. Um, so the second thing we wanted to do uh, is make sure that our, the endurance of these drives would actually outlast the uh, hardware cycle. Uh, typically, we try and keep our hardware around for around four or five years, something along, that, along those lines for storage. Um, and the drive rates per day needs to actually uh, be below a certain threshold in order to actually maintain that. Second thing, or uh, the third thing is disk utilization. Uh, kind of the whole point of this is actually save I.O. Uh, so if we don't actually see much of a savings, um, this isn't really worth doing. Um, and for this project, for a project of this caliber where we're kind of like uh, potentially changing hardware, um, if it's not 10% uh, or better, we're probably not gonna do it. And even at 10%, we'd think long and hard before we did it. Um, 
the reasoning there is like we're going to get things wrong and generally things may seem rosier uh, in a POC than they actually are in full blown production. Um, so we want a bit of kind of engineering margin of error. And application uh, latency, uh, we don't want regressions there. Um, our applications are still be able to operate uh, just as it did before. So in our POC, this is the actual data we saw. Um, in this case, we were actually, uh, we got a little lucky here. We actually had a, we did this with a boot class drive that happened to have a portion of SLC uh, on this disk. And uh, that actually uh, reduced this a little bit uh, than it otherwise would be on just a standard boot class drive. Now in our full blown production, we actually use enterprise drives, um, which have a much higher endurance. Uh, so uh, our concerns there weren't, uh, uh, weren't quite the same as on our PLC. So the IO rates, uh, this is a bit hard to read. Uh, we use a tool called uh, FBO Trace, which is basically able to kind of uh, look at the IOs going into our hard drives um, and look for uh, sequentiality as well as randomness. Um, what you're seeing here is basically just a layered chart of uh, coalesced reads, coalesced writes, as well as random reads and random writes. Um, the random writes is really what to keep your eye on. Uh, that, those are the metadata writes uh, which are dominating in that graph. So what we have, would have expected to see is those random rights to actually be reduced. Um, and indeed, in our, uh, in our POC, we did see that. Uh, also, a thing to note here is uh, you'll see kind of us talking about kind of uh, a, control, um, uh, a control batch of machines. Uh, whenever we're doing uh, a change like this, we always kind of do it kind of in a, in a kind of a scientific way. Uh, we have our test group, we have a control group where we do nothing to, and we really want to see uh, kind of error between the two lines. Uh, we're not actually just looking from like a day-to-day -day change, we're looking, uh, we want to see like change um, at, you know, the same moment in time between two groups of systems. Um, so here we've got our hybrid XFS and our control. Um, now we're looking at application latency. Um, this is probably not quite surprising. Um, um, it's nice that there's no regression, but it's kind of not surprising you'd actually see a, a performance improvement here. Um, in this case, we're seeing about a, something like a 15 to 25 percent reduction uh, because those metadata IOs, the application is no longer having to kind of hang around and wait for them. All right, so now on to like kind of the full rollout. So now we have this problem. We're kind of pretty convinced this is uh, going to work. Um, but we've got like thousands and thousands of machines that we have to uh, convert to hybrid XFS. Um, so how do we actually do this? Uh, this is really where um, we kind of put our production engineering hats on um, and we figure out how we're gonna like automate, uh, automate this change. So we have these storage systems, they're in place, they're actually in production, we cannot take them out of production. Um, and we've gotta drain them, uh, uh, we got to drain them, recreate the file system in this kind of hyper, hybrid, hybrid XFS mode, and then undrain them to put the data back on and load that machine back into our production cluster. So we have two levels of automation that we can use. Um, the first one is a system called FBAR. Um, you can think of this as just a really simple codified alarm remediation. Alarm is raised in our uh, infrastructure. Uh, we then cut some Python code to go remediate that alarm. Um, really simple. Um, uh, really quick to make. Um, the second piece uh, that we have is something called an FBAR job engine. Um, this actually allows you to create kind of these state machine based automation flows, uh, a little bit more complex. Um, to do our conversion, we actually use both. Um, and the way we did it is we used to have an FBAR flow first where an alarm is raised, which basically that machine is requesting conversion. Um, we're able to rate limit that. We actually went beyond rate limiting. We actually had basically a, a pool of hosts that we defined uh, to which an alarm could only be raised if you were in this pool, and then it was rate limited on top of that just to be super safe. Um, once a host was deemed uh, safe to convert, we then uh, sent it to our FBGE flow um, uh, where the actual conversion happens in this kind of state machine uh, system. We don't have a, a whole bunch of time today, so I'm only gonna go through the uh, FBAR flow to kind of give you a taste of kind of how this automation works. Um, so first we raise our alarm. Um, we double check to make sure it's actually staged for conversion. Here we're actually kind of looking for bugs. We wanna make sure that this alarm somehow didn't get raised even though the machine is not uh, targeted for conversion. If it is, uh, we escalate this to a human and say, hey, something's gone wrong here. Uh, someone might need to check on this. Um, if, it, if it is actually in this pool of machines uh, slated to be converted, um, 
we then check to see, hey, maybe this thing has already been converted. If so, we remove it from the staging tier. And uh, lastly, we will run a bunch of safety checks. Um, we want to check for things like, hey, is there actually data on the SSD? Is there an old hybrid XFS setup on this uh, SSD? We expect before a conversion these things to be like perfectly cl uh, clean. Um, if we see any data on these things, we're going to stop the process um, and kick it out. Assuming the SSD is clean, um, uh, the other safety check we're actually going to check for um, is uh, actually the drain state of the machine as well. We want to make sure that uh, it's been drained. Um, if that all checks out, we actually send it off to the, our conversion flow. Um, we then kind of wait an hour and go back to this loop. Uh, in that case, uh, it's actually going to kick out at kind of the second triangle there as it's going to show up that it's already completed. We then clear the alarm. We're good to go. All right. Um, so how did this rollout actually look? Um, this is basically looks. Uh, this is basically our uh, percent complete. Um, we actually probably would have got this conversion done a little bit quicker. You can see at the beginning um, we had a very quick uh, ramp to get probably close to 50% of the machines converted in maybe only two months. We actually ran into a bunch of drain problems unrelated to hybrid XFS, um, so we had to work through those, and that kind of slowed down our conversion process. So. It kind of shows you the power of this uh, automation. Um, we would probably think that we could have done this in six months, probably, if, if, uh, the, uh, if those drain issues weren't there. All right, so not everything goes perfect in life. Um, we, uh, we missed things. We learned things from this. Um, the real, and and uh, some of them, like fragmentation, we kind of suspected, but it's, fragmentation is one of those things that you have to kind of have to wait, you have to wait quite a long time to actually see um, if it's going to be a problem or not. Um, aging file systems is kind of notoriously difficult. Um, but based on our kind of uh, theoretical knowledge of the way the real-time allocator works, this was a possibility. Um, and we did indeed see uh, some fragmentation starting to take hold. It was still better than what we were doing without hybrid XFS, um, but you know, our performance wasn't as, as great as when we started. Um, so this actually pushed us to move to actually a larger extent size. We originally started with 256K. Uh, we then went to one meg. Now, one meg has its own problems, which is you store a 4K file, you're going to burn one meg. Um, so this now, you're moving, up, you're moving, you're trading this fragmentation problem or I.O. efficiency now for storage and efficiency. Um, indeed, this is actually ends up being actually an OK trade, even if you couldn't fix this, because what we observe is something like a 30% uplift in I.O. efficiency for maybe, say, a 10% trade off in storage efficiency. Um, so you're still kind of netting out 20% there. Um, but being engineers, we like kind of perfection. We want to see if, how good we can make this thing. Um, Oh, I guess, uh, yeah, I think I talked about that, yeah. So we went, uh, so now we're kind of our future direction is actually moving to a system that looks a little bit like this. Um, we actually are going to start writing to uh, data onto the uh, SSDs. Um, I have actually a really smart intern working on this, um, and we're going to be getting testing this uh, in the next month. Um, and the idea here is we'll actually take uh, small files and redirect them uh, to the SSD. Um, effectively, before we write them, we're going to set a flag based on the size, redirect that to the SSD, leaving any file, say, larger than 64K on the hard disk. Um, 64K is kind of a guess right now. We actually do a, have to do a bit of an analysis to see, to bounce out how much space we're going to use on the SSD, uh, what impact that will have on the endurance uh, versus kind of the space savings. I think if we can get something to like 5% uh, storage overhead, uh, we'll be in a, a pretty good place. All right, um, ended a little bit early, so uh, any questions? Yes? So, so that's a good question. We actually got lucky in our, uh, in our POC. Um, we had SSDs in our, uh, so we had a, a, the storage stack that we were using for the data warehouse. Uh, those actually had SSDs in them for a totally different use case. Um, and there we got a little bit lucky. So uh, the, the bad side is, is these SSDs were actually boot class. Uh, so there was a lot, kind of a lot of nervousness around like, hey, could you actually use boot class drives for uh, a, a purpose like this? Um, we eventually moved away from those boot class drives. As uh, our hardware skew changed, we kind of had the opportunity to, to make the change. SSDs are actually, flash was actually dropping in price. Um, so we actually, and wanted that extra insurance. But we've actually found with those boot class drives, we've actually been uh, just, we've been okay. So it's not been a problem. 
So the exact code we run in production is upstream. So that statfs behavior, that patch, uh, that is upstream. So if you were to like uh, format your file system, uh, use the RT inherit during the format, uh, you'll get that behavior that we get, which is uh, the statfs will return the space free on the uh, hard disk, not the SSD. Go ahead. Uh, you, you so we don't have plans of using shingled media uh, in this solution, um, and I think right now uh, they're not really something on our radar. Uh, we just have too much like random writes and going on in our systems to kind of make that workable. So. Um, Depending, you know, we may be forced, our hand may be forced eventually, you know, if we start getting like 40T drives, um, that may be something we may have to look at. Um, but uh, so far, I kinda, we try and look out, say like two years, maybe three years, uh, from a, an actual like stuff we're working on today um, will be for that time horizon, and then we're kind of keeping our eye on maybe five or six years out. Uh, but it, the, the vendors kind of change their roadmaps so frequently, it's really hard to actually work on something and then have the vendors kind of change their minds. Yeah, so actually we are. Um, there's actually a bunch of engineers uh, working, I'm pretty sure it's open source, called a, a system called uh, Cachelib. It's basically a library uh, that's designed uh, for caching. Um, and that's actually being integrated into our storage system. And that was, that's the other purpose we're gonna use these SSDs for as well. Now that we've got them, we actually look at them uh, in kind of three different modes. We could use them for metadata, we could use them to store small files, or we can use them uh, to cache data. Um, and the answer is we actually wanna use them for all three. Yes. Uh, so we use one SSD for all of the hard disks. Uh, so our systems have 36 hard disks on our what we call our Bryce Canyon machines, and then we'll put a one terabyte SSD attached to that. So it's actually a very small ratio, and a lot of systems will have like two, even as high as 5% flash uh, for backing their storage. Yeah? Uh, um, they are, I actually have kind of like a, a side bet with my colleagues that, that like, you know, my, uh, my hunch is that like eventually the hard drives actually maybe get more expensive, but what you may end up paying more for is actually unlimited endurance. Um, which is something that hard, uh, Flash will still struggle with. So um, I don't know. Like it's it's going to be an interesting to see the next ten years to see how things play out. Yeah, even with SLC, I think we'd probably still have endurance problems. So the Flash industry would still have to kind of solve that. We we write a lot to our systems. Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So, just quickly on, you know, so all the data that is being written to the HDD side, um, do you guys measure that throughput, and are you pretty much pumping everything that you can to provide not throughput Yeah, so the, uh, so the question, like, are the SSDs kind of bottlenecking the hard disk throughput? So I'd say the, the ratio is largely driven by flash costs. We do look, to, we're, we are looking for things like bottlenecking. Um, generally, um, the, the IOP rate on that flash is, is actually still pretty low, such that that's not an issue. Um, endurance is probably the thing that uh, would be kind of the thing that we'll hit first. So we probably keep a closer eye on the endurance than anything else, um, especially when we start using things like uh, using it for small file caching uh, or cache, like in those cases, if we don't watch it really closely, we could burn out, uh, we could burn out the, the SSD pretty easily. On the hard drive rate, actually, the thing there we find is actually the, the more, the thing to really make sure we size well is really uh, CPU, the NIC, um, and the, and the uh, having enough uh, PCI bandwidth is really what we look for there. Cool. All right, uh, thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, you can come track me down later, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot.